We're now going to take a look at the magnetic media first. So the magnetic media consists of a substrate, an underlayer, the magnetic uh, material and a carbon-based protective overcoat. So the requirements for this include a high coercivity, a large hysteresis loop, high uh, permeability to allow strong flux lines, and a square loop so that we have well-defined distinct states and well-defined switching fields uh, for the magnetic bits. So first we can look at the particulate media. The particulate media, we're talking about a single domain uh, where the size of the uh, domain is smaller than the domain wall width so that we can only have a single domain. So if we do this uh, simple exercise for a spherical particle, if we calculate the magnetostatic energy, we have minus one half mu zero ms dot hd, that's the energy per volume, so we multiply it by volume, hd is our demagnetizing field, ms is our saturation magnetization, mu zero is permeability of free space. Now, since we're talking about the spherical particle, uh, HD is equal to uh, minus NDMS. So if you remember, HD equals to minus ND times MS. So the demagnetizing factor ND is 1 over 3 for a spherical particle. So this would be minus MS over 3. The volume of the sphere is 4 thirds pi R cubed, where R is the radius. So we get in total uh, 2 over 9 mu 0, 2 over 9 pi mu 0 ms square r cube. So we can see that the magnetostatic energy scales as the cube of the radius of the particle. On the other hand, if you look at the domain wall energy per area for a 180 degree domain wall, this is something we calculated before, it was 2 pi square root exchange stiffness times the uniaxial anisotropy constant. And uh, th since this is per area, the total domain wall energy will be 2 pi times pi r square square root a k, where this is the uh, cross-sectional area of our uh, sphere. So I'm assuming that we're going to have a domain wall in the middle of the sphere that is going to separate it into two regions with opposite magnetization. So we will have this situation, the magnetization pointing in this direction on, on one side, in the other direction on the other side, and then we would have a domain wall here that is in the shape of a circle. So if we have one domain wall, the total energy of the system would be mu zero ms square pi r cube over nine because we lose half of the magnetostatic energy by creating a domain wall and we have 2 pi square r square square root a k. Now the domain wall energy scales as r square, magnetostatic energy scales as r cube. So if you look at the energy versus the size of the particle radius, for a single domain the energy increases like this, for a multi-domain the energy increases in a different manner where we have the contribution from the domain wall energy and there is a critical radius where it becomes favorable to have a single domain. So if we calculate that critical radius for iron, which has an exchange stiffness of 9.2 10 to minus 12 joules per meter and uniaxial anisotropy constant 5.7 10 to 4 joules per meter cube, for single domain iron, we would need uh, the total energy pi over 9 mu zero ms square critical radius cube plus 2 pi square critical radius square square root a k equaling to the single domain energy, which is 2 pi over 9 mu zero ms square rc cube. So if we solve for the critical radius here, we find it to be 11.3 nanometers. So large single domain particles can form if the domain wall energy is large or if ms is small and so, so that the magnetostatic energy would be small. The switching mechanism of a single domain particle is coherent rotation that's following the stoner wolfart model, where for the easy access magnetic field, we would have a square hysteresis loop where the coercivity would be equal to the uh, 
uh, anisotropy field, which is 2K U over mu zero ms for uniaxial anisotropy. And the hard axis loop would be uh, a straight line where the uh, saturation occurs at plus or minus the anisotropy field. So this is assuming we have needle type high anisotropy single domain particles for our particulate medium. Now the typical coercivity is 3 kiloersteds. Particle sizes are of the order of tens of nanometers as we calculated for iron. Uh, gamma phase Fe2O3, chromium oxide bonded to a metal or polymer disc is used in tapes. Uh, another possibility is to use granular media polycrystalline tin films. Well, since the voids can co cause problems with homogeneity of the particle distribution in three-dimensional configuration, we can have a, a quasi two-dimensional situation in tin films that do not suffer from voids in different grains. So you can see that if we have the tin film magnetic material consisting of a polycrystalline structure where we have uh, grains in between the magnetic bits and if this is uh, magnetized in the longitudinal direction then you can see that the disc rotation direction would be parallel to the magnetization direction and here you can see that i have chromium segregation into the uh, grain boundaries so 10 to 30 nanometer sized single domain grains can be obtained Cobalt platinum chromium, cobalt chromium tantalum is used usually. Platinum and tantalum are well, well known high Z materials, they have high spin orbit coupling, therefore, they increase the anisotropy. So, they help with the uh, stabilization of the magnetization direction. The chromium is there because it segregates into grain boundaries and reduces intergranular exchange. So, we have decoupling of the bits from each other. Uh, the issues, the main issues with magnetic media include this intergranular interaction. So if you consider three different uh, bits here, A, B and C, you can see that uh, switching from up direction to down direction is assisted by the strong field from particle A for particle C. There is already a built-in field that's coming from the uh, fringing field of the A bit. So there is a net reduction in the coercivity for the switching process. Uh, particles must be isolated by non-magnetic materials along grain boundaries uh, to reduce this intergranular exchange and chromium serves this purpose. Another problem is superparamagnetism. As we reduce the particles, uh, particle sizes, the anisotropy energy that stabilizes the direction of the magnetization, KUV, will also be reduced because the volume is being reduced. And when KUV becomes comparable to KT, the thermal energy, the magnetic bit can spontaneously reverse its direction. It's unable to maintain its data because the thermal energy is enough to cause fluctuations uh, and that can result in flipping of the magnetization direction. For practical applications, we would require this anisotropy energy to be at least 40 times the thermal energy, which is one electron volt at room temperature. And we say that the superparamagnetic limit has been reached when we, uh, when we go below this range for uh, industrial application purposes. By arrhenius neel law, uh, the time it takes for a particle to reverse its magnetization is given by tau equals tau zero e to the anisotropy energy divided by thermal energy, where this tau zero is 10 to minus 9 to 10 to minus 10 seconds. It's related to the uh, dynamic properties of magnetization, the fMR frequencies, etc. So when KUV is equal to 40 kT, you can calculate that tau will be approximately 10 years. So for a magnetic medium to be applicable, to have an industrial application, it has to have a stability of at least 10 years. And superparamagnetic particles do not show hysteresis, but they still have a large magnetic moment. Now, regarding the uh, media here, we're going to, uh, to see two important improvements. Uh, one is to get the, per, uh, the perpendicular direction, uh, perpendicular magnetization, and two is basically opening up the uh, direction for terabit per inch square uh, recording. So let's take a look at these videos and I will give the link 
uh, for this. You lose your magnetic orientation. You flip and lose your data. Well, what can we do? Gotta make more room. But how? Well, I've been working hard and I've found a way. You gotta get perpendicular. Get perpendicular? Think about it. If all you bits stand up instead of lie down, you make more space for new bits. More bits, more data. But how are we gonna stand up? Leave that to me. One, two, three. Kick it. Okay, so this is basically a big improvement in the... Uh, data storage industry to make the bits stand perpendicular and uh, let's take a look at this one Like me, you know you'll be feeling groovy watching any film you could hope to see. In the the gigabyte to the gigabyte, the terabyte is out of sight. Now you can store more of your life. So this was a commercial for uh, the terabits per inch square recording technology. And uh, so I will give the links to these videos so you can watch them in full if you wish. Uh, the last thing I would like to talk about is the underlayers and the substrate. The substrate must have high hardness. This is for mechanical stability. It has to have low density for shock resistance, a high modulus for reduced vibrations, it has to have good thermal stability. Of course, it has to have a low cost. And uh, for these purposes, nickel phosphide uh, glasses um, are used. This will also affect the grain size and the crystal orientation of the uh, magnetic layers that we grow on top. The under layer promotes adhesion to the substrate. It's there to protect from corrosion. Um, physical isolation of grains is achieved using the under layer. Chromium, chromium vanadium gives in plain easy access and it also improves lattice mismatch. So these are some of the considerations. As for the overcoat, which the te this technology is called tribology, it's used to prevent wear. Uh, so we have head crash uh, related wear. So this is prevented by using this uh, overcoat. It must have low friction. Carbon hydrogen uh, covered with a lubricant is usually used. Uh, for this purpose. Okay, so we talked about the magnetic uh, medium uh, part of the uh, hard disk drive where we, we have substrate under layer uh, magnetic material and a protective overcoat. We talked about a particulate medium, uh, the granular medium, polycrystalline tin films and some of the issues like intergranular interactions and super paramagnetism and we have found out that to have a uh, thermal stability of our bits, we require uh, anisotropy energy at least 40 times the thermal energy. It is important that we move to a technology where these bits are uh, oriented perpendicular. So we have perpendicular magnetization instead of 
in plane magnetization because that opens up a lot of space and leads to terabits per inch square recordings of the Terra era. Uh, and as for the underlayers and substrate, we have several important uh, requirements that we have to consider when actually designing a hard disk drive medium.